There are many lunar development concepts that just flat out won't work, but are still so frequently thought of and presented as good ideas. This is certainly not intentional misinformation, for most of these ideas appear logical on a surface level, it's just that their flaws lie deeper, outside the boundary of pure functionality, and are only found when comparing alternatives within the context of an organized lunar development blueprint. Additionally, and perhaps more importantly, they have simply become outdated. Fortunately for humanity, the past few years, and especially 2023, have seen a huge amount of new information come to light regarding the moon, largely thanks to the Indian and Chinese lunar missions and NASA's SOFIA program. But time is rarely kind to old ideas, and this new stream of knowledge has eroded many standing lunar development concepts we took for granted. Thus, this video's purpose is to gain perspective by beating the crap out of your favorite lunar concepts. I'm Ian Long, and this is Anthrofuturism. To start, I think the biggest misconception people have when they imagine lunar development is that we can live and work in surface structures. The reason this will never happen is radiation. The moon is just way too radiated, and you need to cover all structures in a thick layer of lunar regolith to protect inhabitants from the ambient environmental radiation. This one is the most obvious, but is still so heavily propagated across the internet. You know what I mean, you've seen this. Images of astronauts living in little inflatable buildings or glass domes scattered across the surface of the moon willy-nilly. Fortunately, many people are beginning to learn more about the moon and show interest in lunar development, which is reflected in a recent increase in more accurate images. Now you'll frequently see very inaccurate images of exposed glass domes next to slightly more accurate images of lunar structures covered by a protective regolith shell. But even these more accurate images are not actually all that accurate, and they often have weird elements to them that seem to contradict the underlying principle, like this image released on the official European Space Agency's website, which shows the astronauts' dwellings covered in regolith, but their greenhouses containing precious food remain completely exposed. Alright, I understand that most of these are just meant to convey surface level concepts to the general public, however, my biggest gripe is that even the very accurate representations of lunar bases, such as this image here, fail to convey the appropriate scale with which we need to bury our structures. Any structure on the moon will need to be buried under at least 3 meters, about 10 feet of regolith. Does this look 10 feet thick to you? In general, it's going to be much better to build our lunar bases like hobbit holes, in literal holes. Done this way, the walls of the hole, the lunar surface, will be the lateral radiation shield, except instead of 3 meters thick, they'll be several miles thick. Once you have a hole, you can build a structure and then cover the structure with all the regolith excavated from the hole, thus shielding the top. We could put habitable spaces in craters or lava tubes, but lava tubes would have similar structural issues as terrestrial mine shafts and caves, potentially collapsing, so will need to be surveyed and reinforced appropriately. Likewise, the slopes of craters are covered in loose deposits of regolith and boulders undisturbed for millennia, which could become dislodged and tumble down in massive moon rock regolith slides. I mean, these aren't really problems as much as just things to take note of, but a big advantage that digging a hole gives is the ability to shape it according to your exact specifications to conform to any structural blueprint. In contrast, your blueprint will need to conform to the naturally occurring geometry of the lava tube or crater you intend to use. Next, we have solar power, which I believe is the most pernicious misconception that refuses to die, mostly because solar good, nuclear bad. Sure, the moon has an abundance, an excess, a plethora, an absolutely overwhelming amount of raw, unfiltered sunlight, free energy blasted across the lunar surface, cooking anything and everything during the 13 and a half Earth days long lunar day, but it's immediately followed by 13 and a half Earth days of freezing cold energy sucking darkness during the lunar night. Thus, we need a way to keep the lights on during the night so our people don't freeze and suffocate to death, resulting in more than a few negative Google reviews. So we just use batteries, right? That's what the solar enthusiasts propose. So let's just run a quick cost analysis between a solar grid system and a nuclear grid system, which I will leave in the description below for time's sake. 
The results are highly in favor of using existing nuclear reactors over solar, as a solar panel configuration would cost about $33,600 per cubic meter of habitable space, while a nuclear power configuration would cost only $500 per cubic meter of habitable space, 98.5% less than solar. This is almost entirely because of the cost of batteries needed in a solar configuration. Next, we have the thermal wadi generator concept, which I was actually a huge fan of, and at one point nearly even patented a design for, which would have been a huge loss since this idea was killed by information that literally just came out at the end of August. So the lunar thermal wadi concept is basically the idea that due to the lack of convection on the moon, one could potentially store thermal energy in a reservoir like a block of basalt. Since the moon gets very hot during the daytime and cold at night, but lacks an atmosphere to convect heat away, heat loss of the block could be minimized by setting it on insulating feet to reduce conductive loss and then covering it in a reflective material to reflect energy loss to radiation back into the thermal mass. Theoretically, a large enough block could retain enough heat to last the entire night, and that thermal energy could then be converted into electricity via a heat engine, such as a Stirling engine, basically a heat battery. But in 2023, the Indian Moon Mission Surface Thermophysical Experiment Probe revealed an astonishing discovery about the moon's temperature gradient. While investigating the profile of the lunar topsoil around the pole, the probe discovered a rapid and dramatic temperature drop just beneath the surface. In particular, the surface temperature dropped from positive 50 degrees Celsius to negative 10 degrees Celsius within just 10 centimeters of depth. Even more, a decline from positive 20 degrees Celsius to negative 10 degrees Celsius was observed in a mere 60 millimeters. This shows that the lunar regolith is actually an incredibly powerful insulator, effectively containing heat within an extremely thin surface layer, meaning it does not conduct heat well at all. This would reduce any thermal wadi generator efficiency significantly and greatly increase design complexity as they would need to continuously use their own generated power to churn hot powdered regolith to constantly make contact with the heat exchanger or run some sort of gas through the powdered regolith to convect heat from it. Maybe it'll still work, but is it better than existing nuclear tech alternatives? Next, we have lunar concrete, or lunarcrete as it's come to be called, which is probably unjustifiably costly to make. The basic ingredients for lunarcrete would be the same as those for terrestrial concrete, aggregate, water, and cement. In the case of lunarcrete, the aggregate would be lunar regolith. The cement could be manufactured from the silica, aluminum, calcium, and magnesium found in lunar regolith, but the fatal flaw of lunar concrete is the need for either lots of water or lots of sulfur, neither of which is particularly abundant on the moon. Water is almost certainly out of the question, as it is too precious to waste on concrete production. However, sulfur can be used in its stead, and there is actually natural sulfur on the moon. And again, we can thank the Indian Moon Mission for confirming this, as the Pragyan rover detected significant concentrations of sulfur in the polar regolith. However, significant in this case is still a tiny percentage of lunar regolith by weight. How much? Well, at this time we still don't really know, which means it's hard to calculate whether or not we can realistically gather enough of the stuff to justify the cost and equipment and space that would be required to manufacture lunarcrete on a scale worthy of implementing. Fortunately, we don't necessarily need to lay lunarcrete foundations for all of our structures, which will largely be held down by the tons of regolith piled atop them. Basically, it boils down to if we can easily gather lots of sulfur, then great, let's make it. But if not, then it's not the end of the world. Also, it's worth noting that any sulfur we do gather may have higher priority uses as it can be used to make sealants and even fertilizer. Although making fertilizer would be useless because we will never farm on the moon, at least not in any capacity outside of some experimental gardening. Many people have hoped we could use slightly processed lunar regolith to grow plants. The hope was we could make regolith suitable for agriculture by just grinding it up a little and then adding water and nutrients. 
This process even seemed to work well using lunar regolith simulants, from which plants grew healthy. In fact, so much research was done in this area that we even found the perfect ratio of fertilizer to lunar simulant optimal for plant growth, which was 70-30. However, in 2022, NASA scientists used actual lunar samples, not simulants, but actual lunar regolith brought back from the Apollo missions to attempt growing a plant I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of, a very hard and well-studied plant. After adding water and nutrients to the lunar regolith, the plant did grow. Terribly. The plant experienced slower growth, stunted roots, and in some cases, reddish pigmentation on leaves. This showed two things. First, the lunar regolith needs more work to be suitable for growth. And second, our lunar simulants also need more work to be suitable simulants, to serve as accurate analogs for real lunar regolith. Perhaps we'll find inexpensive ways to convert sharp radioactive lunar regolith into soft radish loving soil, but even if this happens, the whole notion of farming on the moon is rendered pointless when we consider the bigger picture. It is so easy to grow things on Earth. So easy, in fact, it's almost as if this planet was the most natural place for plant life to grow in the entire solar system. Here, we can literally throw seeds on the ground and the environment does most of the work. No radiation, stable temperatures, plenty of oxygen and carbon, abundant water and nutrients. Hell, crops even get free bonus water a few times a year when the local climate goes into a periodic rainy season. On the moon and pretty much everywhere besides Earth, it's different. We have to do a lot more work than simple soil processing to grow crops. We have to hermetically enclose a space and then pressurize it with the right amounts of oxygen and carbon and nitrogen, add a regenerative closed loop life support system, and then protect this enclosed space from radiation. On Earth, specifically in the United States, farm real estate value averaged $3,800 per acre for 2022, or roughly 94 cents per square meter. On the moon, habitable real estate costs around $55,000 per square meter. What this means is it costs $55,000 to make one square meter habitable for humans or plants, or roughly $222.58 million per acre. With highly efficient modern farming technology on Earth, 10,000 square meters, one hectare, can yield enough calories to feed on average five, five people per year. Do I need to do the math to show how infeasible farming on the moon is? Even if the lunar regolith itself needed no treatment whatsoever, the cost of enclosure would still make it senseless to farm on the moon. In fact, if lunar regolith just so happened to be the greatest agricultural substrate in the entire known universe, it would still be more cost effective to scoop it up and ship it back to Earth as fertilizer than to grow things on the moon. Finally, we have mass drivers. The mass driver is a launch system that would use electricity rather than fuel to launch payloads from the lunar surface without needing to use an Earth-built rocket. It uses electromagnets to generate thrust force very much like modern maglev trains, basically a giant coil gun. I loved this concept so much, I made an entire video on it called Space Trains, which was one of my favorite videos to make ever, but alas, it's dead. This is because of the very simple reality that it's so relatively easy to reach lunar escape velocity that the cost to build and especially power a kilometer long mass driver just isn't worth it. The whole idea of a mass driver is to be a reusable infrastructure. But even if you're sending thousands of tons of cargo beyond lunar orbit to the Earth, Mars, or beyond, you're still better off just launching the payload with traditional vacuum-optimized rocket engines, which, might I point out, are also reusable. It basically fails because of the same logic that causes railroads across the ocean to fail. Like, we don't need to build road and rail infrastructure across oceans because ships are already so cheap, no rail could compete. Alright, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please tell YouTube by writing a handwritten letter and mailing it to 901 Cherry Avenue, San Bruno, California, 94066 USA, or by just clicking the like button. Subscribe if you want to be shown, like, one or two more of my videos in your feed before the algorithm moves on and force feeds you Mr. Beast videos, and connect with me on Instagram or Facebook. And you can pick up my book on Amazon if you still remember how to read.